Hey everybody, I'm Ross Hudgens and I'm excited to welcome everybody to the second episode of Content and Conversation. Today we again have two great guests in Tom Critchlow and Corey Uh Tom is a former VP of Strategy at Distilled, uh, independent consultant now working with big companies, helping with big problems like strategy, consulting, SEO, internal uh, headspace, and all the big issues that bigger companies face. Uh, Corey is a CEO of Factorial Digital, which is a consulting strategy shop that again helps SEO companies on the enterprise side help with big problems, including hiring, vendor selection, uh, technical issues, and all those big things. These are two guys that I look to for enterprise consulting and content marketing specifically, which brings us to today's subject, and that's uh, enterprise content marketing in particular. These two bring a lot of expertise in working with the clients that they do, and I think we'll have a lot of insights specifically. So the first question I have uh, for the both of you is kind of one of the things, what do you most commonly see uh, occur uh, from a mistake point of view for these bigger companies? Uh, Corey, I don't know what comes top of mind uh, from the mistake. Yeah, so on the lens. content marketing side, the biggest mistake that uh, we're generally seeing is the companies are creating the content uh, and then not really putting a lot of thought into like the planning process and understanding what the results they're actually gonna get from the content that they're creating. So they have these great ideas of different concepts that they're going to start producing. They don't necessarily have outline of what the goal is. And what happens is kind of after the fact, they just look at the direct conversions from the content and they become pretty frustrated with content marketing as a whole because they haven't really approached it from the start correctly. So I'd say truly understanding what is the objective of that piece of content because in reality it might not necessarily be to convert from that first click. It could be to generate awareness and put that person into a retargeting pool or something like that. I think the biggest challenge I see companies facing is, especially companies where content marketing comes from a place of SEO, or there's like an SEO in agency involved, is I feel like the, the discipline of SEO is quite backwards looking. It's like you're often optimizing existing pages, you're working with content that already exists, uh, updating things behind the scenes, like XML sitemaps, that kind of thing. And there's a real mind mindset shift uh, for content marketing, which is, content is necessarily a visible um, extension of the company. And so it touches so many more things from brand, sales, conversion, social, content that you're making can end up going in emails. Um, and there's kind of a much wider ecosystem. And so the mistake that I see a lot of companies make, especially on the enterprise level, is thinking about it too narrowly and trying to pitch the content or pitch a campaign through a very narrow lens. And it's good to have some kind of measurable outcomes, but you also have to make sure that is it going to work for the sales team? Like, is the uh, social team going to see it and like it? Is there a way to reuse this content in, um, you know, our emails that we're sending out, that kind of thing? And so, uh, especially at the enterprise level, you have to think holistically across the whole organization. How is it going to content going to play? Um, and we've been, I've been in situations where, you know, a content marketing agency or a content marketing team is trying to create content, and the CMO. Walks, uh, walks along and is like, hey, what is this that we're making? Or the CEO walks in and is like, hey, I saw this piece of content on our site and I didn't like the way it landed or it doesn't speak to me. And that can be a kind of a, a hard thing to swallow or a hard thing to plan for. But the way to mitigate it is to make sure that you're planning for the content marketing in a way that fits the forward-looking nature of the brand, right? It's like rather than thinking of it as where are we today, it's more so like where is the company trying to get to and trying to work within frameworks of, you know, what is our brand guidelines? What is the marketing campaigns we're doing? You know, what other agencies we have involved? Um, and it's a lot to, to kind of handle all at once, but that's where I see companies failing is trying to think of it too narrowly. Like, try, well, we're trying to do keywords, we're trying to do search, we're trying to do links. Um, and in an enterprise company, content is so much more visible. Yeah, I mean, you touched on what exactly my thing was going to be, which is consistency with voice and brand guidelines. And it kind of ties in your example as well, Corey. It's just like a lot of these people don't, they just go out and do content and they're doing it in lots of different ways and their messaging and their uh, style guides and things like that have lots of different appearances. And in, in total, generally that thing will mean you're not going to convert from that content. Also, your customers might end up not happy with that content, uh, which is the worst case scenario. But in a perfect world, I think the content that performs best down the line is one that you're upfront, you're doing the bragging guidelines, the content strategy feels dialed in, the voice is spot on, you know you're speaking to the customer, and all of those good things. Um, Tom, I specifically, one of our conversations the last time we talked, uh, I liked your thoughts on brand differentiation, especially for these larger companies, and I think search, I, specifically, there's 
certain questions I think you can only differentiate so much in SEO. Like if I brought it up on our first episode is if we're talking about wedding invitation etiquette or something like that, there's only so much you can do to answer that question in a, in a good way. So I think there's got to be some brand strategy or something like that to kind of like differentiate you. Uh, and you had some good thoughts there. So I'm just curious your point of view of how brands can think about that, execute that and uh, bring it to market. Yeah, um, I mean, obviously it depends on the industry, how you go about doing it. I've seen clients do it, everything from uh, how can we create content at a different level than the competitors, whether it's like adding video when no one's doing video or uh, adding interactivity when no one's adding interactivity, or whether it's really trying to go and be up and be above and beyond with research, um, getting survey data and pulling that in, trying to create unique insights into a space. Um, I think that it's another way that executives can get frustrated at SEO when they see people trying to make stuff that is very uh, ordinary, right? It's like sometimes uh, it's kind of ironic that sometimes you can try and pitch, say, hey, we should have like 100 pages on these keywords because people search for them and we'll rank for them and we'll pull people in. And executives often, th that is not motivating for them. What they care about is how are we going to make a delightful experience? How are we going to make sure that when somebody lands on this wedding invitation etiquette page, they get an experience of who we are and what we do and how we're different than the competition. Um, and a lot of people, certainly in kind of the SEO uh, kind of focus, forget again that this content lives within a broader ecosystem. They forget that you know people want to communicate, uh, you know, the special offers they have or the way their product is differentiated and, mm -hmm. and so on. So um, sometimes it can be a challenge, especially when you're trying to do that at scale. Um, uh, but that's kind of the, the fun of it as well, is trying to figure out a way to say, how might we make this content that truly stands out and truly differentiates? Um, I know you guys do a lot of like, you know, you guys make a lot of kind of bottom or middle funnel content where you work hard in the competition, right? Just make a better page, um, which I think is, is effective. Yeah, and it's a good point. I think there's some massive domain authority players who decide to do content in some way and they're putting out content and uh, maybe they can rank for that very well. But there's also ranking number one, and I think also achieving the objective. So I think it's an interesting right. point that, yes, someone can land on wedding invitation etiquette if you're some wedding site that happens to be the most authoritative, but is whatever you did there create such an impression that that person kind of stops and that impression resonates in some way? And I'm sure there are several examples of these massive brands who, yes, rank and think they're doing so great, but is that resonating and actually creating the action that they want through that content uh, overall? Right. Um, any thoughts on that, Corey? Yeah, I, I think a lot of uh, a lot of times when when we're working with brands, what we find is we're, we're generally put, uh, pitching these really like bold concepts that are a little outside of their comfort zone. But what we're what we're trying to convey to them exactly to Tom's point is like the ordinary content isn't really the content that yeah you might rank for it but at the end of the day it's really going to move the needle it's going to be something that's interesting is it going to get a bunch of links uh, if you kind of stay within a little bit of a box I think you're going to struggle and a, a, a great point you brought up was about leveraging data and, and, right. and surveys and things like that and sometimes a lot of uh, a lot of times the data is actually you already have it you don't even need to go out and find it like a good example is um, uh, Instacart. Had, you know, created an infographic and, 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 and uh, created a bunch of visualizations of their own internal data, of like uh, food that was purchased by time of day, or uh, Airbnb has an engineering blog, and they, they highlight a lot of like the struggles and the, the challenges that they face internally, and they have great data visualization, they tell a great story, and that type of content, uh, I think, connects with m maybe not all of their potential customers, but it connects with a subset. And that content can support other content that they create, and that content can uh, you know, gain so many um, linking root domains, which is going to elevate your whole entire content catalog. So, I mean, leveraging data is, uh, I think, probably where most companies are going to start heading in the next, I don't know, six to eighteen months, mm -hmm. um, and and ideally moving away from kind of just the generic, like, exclusively like how-to articles and things like yeah. that. I, one of the things I've been seeing recently and I've really liked is some general SEO elements that might be commonly thought of, title tag, boilerplate content for e-commerce pages. There are examples of people actually using those spaces to show voice in some way. And, and it's subtle, but I, I notice it in search results where someone makes the choice to use certain language, maybe it's the best X and then they put a little common thing at the end of every title tag. Uh, maybe everyone else uses the exact title 
uh, they capitalize every word, while this one goes lowercase. It has a certain feel to it that also connects to that brand messaging. Uh, another great example that I like referencing a lot is Redbubble. I was really impressed when I just, it's a t-shirt and design company, and you go to their site and you go to their e-commerce pages and their boilerplate content is actually, speaks with voice and personality. So when you land on that page, you yes, you achieve some SEO goals of having some unique copy, but they're also punching it home their brand voice. Uh, through that content. So I think that's kind of an opportunity to think, yes, it's subtle elements, but ways to sh show your voice and your personality to differentiate. A good example is like this. You know what I mean? Like you've created this piece of content to differentiate, which I mean, frankly, in, at least in the SEO space, there's, there's not a lot of this out there. And so like you yourself are doing it, the exact thing that we're talking about of like creating a differentiation, having your own voice. I mean, you're, you're on the, you're on the video. <laughs> uh, and and it's, I mean, it's, I think it's, this type of content is, is the type of content that companies likely strive to, to create. Yeah, I mean, you guys are both champions of content and obviously when the bigger e enterprise content marketing problem is just getting people to do that in some way. So you guys are just curious of how you've achieved that, tactics and techniques you use to get companies to think and execute content. Uh, maybe start with you, Tom. Yeah, um, it's interesting that I think getting companies to buy into content is, in some sense, is easier than it's ever been, right? Like content marketing is kind of well established now and people understand why they should be doing it and there are good, lots of good case studies you can point to of, of clients who do it well uh, or, or companies who do it well. Um, and I think that increasingly the, my challenge or my personal objective with a lot of clients is to make them do it better, right? And to make it, make, say, instead of doing it in a kind of scalable, you know, keyword focus way, do it in a way that we're just talking about of like, how do we add personality? How do we add brand? How do we do it in a way? How do we make content that somebody gives a shit about as well, right? It's like, yeah, you and I had a back and forth a blog post about that recently about um, who gives a shit about your content and, and quite how much you can outsource some of that, right? Um, and I think it's an interesting question of, of, you know, if you really want to make something that's going to have a lasting impression for potential clients, potential audience, um, there's only so much, like you can outsource pieces of it, and certainly agencies like Siege do really good work, um, but I feel like there is a level of investment that the client or the company has to have mm -hmm. in caring about it and caring about the execution, caring about doing things like this, you know, like video, going above and beyond, adding personality. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's also really interesting that increasingly in today's world, Google is really good at understanding brands, understanding differentiation. And so, you know, the days of saying, well, this is what people search for, therefore we must meet them exactly where they are, it, like those days are long gone, right? Like Google wants people to say, well, this is the keyword, but here's how I'm going to answer the broad, the broader query or the real intent behind it. Um, and here's how I'm going to stand out. Here's how I'm going to make it interesting. Uh, and I think that's kind of some of the, um, the work that I get excited about. It's obviously a, a slow fight, right? A, a long yeah. fight sometimes, <laughs> yeah. um, which, uh, which is interesting. Um, one of the things as well is, uh, especially at enterprise level, I feel like uh, trying to position the opportunity gap between what competitors are doing and what they're doing is is a very big motivator, right? Uh, you, you know, the data will tell one story, but saying, well, this competitor that you care so much about crushing is actually beating you in like LinkedIn shares or Twitter shares or whatever. Um, and positioning that as a, like, we should have a multi-million dollar investment in this space to like win. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, enterprise companies care a lot about winning. Yeah, I imagine. <laughs> um, more so than like just incremental growth, they care about being the best in their market mm -hmm. or the number one player. Um, and so positioning it that way is often a, a good way to kind of get buy-in or budget for mm -hmm. some of those bigger projects. I'm curious what, what your thoughts are on that. I mean, it's, it's challenging for sure. I mean, across the board, everyone wants more, better con content faster tomorrow. Yeah, and it's, <laughs> it's a little intense and overwhelming. But I think where I spend a lot of my time with, with companies is, is, is on the planning side of like, why are we creating this piece of content? Um, but then also giving really smart talking points to the internal teams. So that way when they're communicating with all of their internal stakeholders about generating that piece of content and maybe generating a bold piece of content that they can actually start selling it internally a little bit because those stakeholders either become advocates with you or they become blockers. And so like you have to decide which, which one is that person going to be for you. And so like things that um, we, we started to shift the conversation around uh, brand marketing. So like if you think about like SEO as being like, you have non-brand search, or you have branded search. Branded search is actually very important. And it's one of those most like neglected things that people are often overlooking or not thinking about. Um, but then if you look at how much money, at least on the enterprise side, how much money they're spending on marketing, I think brand marketing receives a 2x more budget allocation on sort of brand and loyalty and customer retention than it does on customer acquisition. So brand marketing or branded search becomes 
uh, extremely important and one that you can create content that supports that brand and supports customer retention while simultaneously supporting customer acquisition. Not an easy thing to generate, but it's an easy thing to sort of coincide the story with branded, branded search. And secondarily, uh, I think you, you mentioned it before, of like repurposing some of your content uh, and, and reusing it and recycling it and, and not just using it for one single purpose of like generating a piece of content for this conversion moment or this, this event. Uh, if you generate a piece of content and then if you could get the paid search team to want to create content for testing and if you, if you know that looking at your competitors, they're doing a bunch of listicles of like nine reasons why you should buy X product. If you could create very similar content that the paid search team can use, you've actually not even talked about SEO at all and you've just leveraged their budget, their resources, um, and also their, their advocacy for that piece of content because it tells uh, a better story of the brand and actually has high conversion elements, things like that. So I mean, the, and then the last piece, sorry, is uh, the, the, the measurement. The measurement is, 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 is critical. And so creating an objective for that piece of content, because what we find is like we'll map out content. I think, um, I mean, I've seen this type of chart before, just like opportunity and um, intent. And so you can have like super high intent and, and high opportunity, and that's like the greatest piece of content that you could create. But at the same time, you could have uh, high intent and low opportunity, but still very important piece of content to create. If you're not creating that high intent, low opportunity content, you're missing a huge subset of content that you should be creating. So you map out what the intent is, and that way you have uh, an understanding of conversions really early on. You've created that content with the understanding that conversions are gonna be pretty low, and that's okay. And you can accept that beforehand, because if you go look at it after the fact, you're gonna be pretty frustrated, and resources are pulled from a project, they might uh, not focus on the blog anymore, engineering support is removed from the blog because it's not high impact, and those things come up quite often. But Ross, what about you? Yeah, I mean, from our point of view, I mean, when, when clients come to us and as an agency, it's a kind of different fight. I, you guys definitely champion the content marketing flag, but when people come to us, I find the most consistent argument to get things done is you look at the traffic value or traffic cost of your competitors using SEMrush, Hrefs, you plug them in, you say, that's where they are, this is where you are. Basically, we can get there if we invest, invest in this content. Or similarly, say there's a uh, moving calculator, say, uh, the cost of moving, those kinds of things. We can take what's ranking number one, plug that into SEMrush or Hrefs, and we can see other people are willing to bid, say it's 20,000 per month, on that asset or that traffic, hypothetically. And that's why I like that metric because it can say, hey, if you, this is worth 20,000 to someone this month, if you can multiply that by 12, it has a value of um, 240,000 per year, why wouldn't you spend 8,000 on this calculator in building it? It's such an easy argument when, if they have the faith that you can rank for that asset. Of course, you have to make a compelling argument with uh, having done it before or your materials or things like that, but it's worked pretty consistently. And I think generally for anyone who's in-house in is just, you're going to a stakeholder and you say this asset or this content marketing campaign, people are willing to bid on that, shows it has actual transactional value. Therefore, if we plug in 10K, there's reasonable expectation that we can output 240K uh, from, that con from that idea. And obviously we wanna level up to those other things which is like the bigger brand thinking, which I think you're so great at, Tom. Uh, but when we're walking in the door, it's like ROI, ROI, ROI. And uh, that's what we find is the easiest path towards doing that. Uh, it's interesting you say that, Russ. Uh, one of the like fastest ways to level up the like influence and buy-in and importance of the work that you do is stop talking about monthly search volume and monthly numbers and talk about yearly search volume, yearly numbers. <laughs> like, yeah. the, like the number of times you're actually optimizing anything for a month by month framework, or like SEO and uh, organic traffic is a compounding effect, right? And so it's like, you can instantly just make all your numbers sound more important and bigger by multiplying by 12. Or by 24, yeah, right? I like, mean, I mean, like, you look at the yeah. lifetime value of this work, right? Like you said, yeah. you rank number one for that moving calculator, like, over a two year, five year time frame, you're getting tons of value from that. Mm -hmm. Why would you talk about it as, like, it has 1,200 searches a month? Like, it's, you know, we do ourselves such a disservice, I think, by Saying just because the tool right. spit that out to us and because, like, that's the, the way we've been trained, mm -hmm. um, it's such a backwards way of thinking, right? Um, you know, you're building a compounding thing. Why mm -hmm. would you talk about it that way? And you're also, you could also justify uh, not only revenue gain, but also, um, money saved 
You know, like you could just say, listen, like these guys are spending whatever the number you said, ten or twenty thousand dollars a month on this particular term. We don't have to. Like we're gonna we're gonna acquire that traffic uh, for for free, essentially. You know, and then uh, it's a, it's a easier way to kind of jumpstart the conversation because I think that gets especially like leadership's nose opens a little bit. So right, right. Um, I want to come back to something you mentioned earlier, Corey, about the, um, the brand marketing. Um, I think you're absolutely right that um, certainly when you start working with bigger organizations, you start understanding how big those brand budgets are. Um, it's kind of a, a personal pet peeve of mine. Like when you look at the content marketing industry and the SEO industry, so many of like the best examples of content that are referenced mm -hmm. were made by ad agencies. Right. right? And it's like when uh, I think um, it's a really useful exercise is to get familiar with how ad agencies and creative agencies pitch some of that work. Right. They don't pitch it with like search volume and keywords and that kind of thing. They're not talking about links. They're talking about we're trying to position ourselves a certain way. Our brand is trying to be an aspirational vision of X, right. Y, and Z. And the budgets are often way bigger than, than traditional SEOs are used to playing with, um, which is why they can do such interesting content, right? Like right. they can spend a million dollars on a, on a video because they're right. going to spend TV like the ad tie, behind the it. Commercial, and, you know, right? Yeah, 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 exactly. I mean, that was probably more than a million dollars. Of but, course. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's like uh, an epic piece of content. Right, right. Yeah. But like, it, it frustrates me when people reference some of that work as an example of what we should be, like people should do in the that's SEO right. industry or the content marketing industry where it's like, that is not our benchmark. Right. That is unless you're trying to pitch that kind of work, which is, you know, if you want to go do that, then great. But um, it, that industry functions in a very different way, um, I, which isn't to say that we can't learn from it. Right. Like right. And there's a, a ton to be learned from getting good at packaging up the work that we're doing, pitching it in a deliberate manner, like adding the polish, the thinking behind the brand, the brand framework, you know, what how we're going to do content at that level. There's lots of things that we can learn from. Um, but until you go play at that stage. Don't go give me examples of the Tide ad as like content right. marketing. You know what right. I mean? Like it's it doesn't make any sense. It's like the PR story. You know, like PR is like PR does a great job of socializing internally right. how great they are. And uh, I think as SEOs and content marketers, we could leverage some of that storytelling internally. Um, and you could even leverage creating a piece of content and throwing it onto Bull and Outbrain. You get millions of impressions pretty inexpensively. <laughs> uh, no it's, value. Yeah, yeah, but, but that's right. But like the thing is, you could you could create that kind of story and say like, listen, right. this, we we were able to create this piece of content and get all these eyeballs on it, and also maybe generate a level of interest that was was different than before, and also you generate a piece of content that um, could be a little bit stickier with uh, existing customers. So you could take that content and it's like value. So like for example, like um, if you do, if you take a export of all of your live chat conversations or even like uh, this, um, what is it called? Uh, the, the CRM for um, customer service. Zendesk, yeah, like Zendesk. So you export all of those conversations. Now you have like a gold mine of a bunch of content that you could be creating um, that's not only interesting for prospective customers because they likely have very similar questions, but also you could create content to keep you know the branded search content value high uh, and then push all that content through like to bull and outbrain, and, and those customers will be interested. And the numbers are massive. You know what I mean? Number of impressions, <laughs> like how many impressions? So it's, it's a huge number, and everyone gets pretty excited about that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Yeah, uh, obviously, kind of transitioning. We we're talking about people who aren't doing content marketing, how to get buy in. How about companies that are doing it well? I mean, you're also working with lots of companies. Hopefully, some of them are thinking about content marketing in the right way. They have different frameworks of executing and thinking about their content. What do you find is most effective? What uh, frameworks or systems are you seeing that are working? Corey? Yeah, so I think the, I mean, I'm, I've said the word planning a couple times, um, but leveraging tools or technologies that make their, their job really easy to plan content. So like a really simple project um, management tool is called Flow and lets you visualize all of that content. But the cool thing with Flow is you can actually uh, create a workflow or create sort of a process. So let's say you wanted to, for a quarter, you wanted to make sure you created a bunch of high intent, high opportunity content and that created, that generated $100,000 in revenue. You could create that as a, a line item and high priority in your workflow. And you create this entire workflow for content production and so like content calendar. And you could leverage that and just repeat it every single quarter. And you don't have to kind of reinvent the wheel. You can optimize it for your organization. Um, but then secondarily, like having something that is a very easy to understand plan of how that content is doing because what generally happens is when, when at least for our clients uh, on you know, the enterprise side, they're creating a bunch of content and a lot of people, since they've dedicated the money and the time and the resources internally, they want to know really fast how the results are doing. 
And so having content that reassures them that we're headed in the right direction, and like, what is, do, we, do we have line of sight that this content is going to perform? So it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily have to perform today, but we have to have like a, a high degree of confidence that that content is actually going to perform in the future. And so having one really simple to understand document, like, I mean, even, you know, I think like historically in like corporate environments, they have like red, yellow, green, you know, you know under indicators of how uh, an activity is doing. Um, you could just add like an, uh, an, an emoji or like just a thumbs up, or thumbs down. <laughs> like it's doing good or it's doing bad, but a really simple version. way to understand whether or not you're doing a good job. So, I mean, that's that, that's the things that, that we're doing. But how about you, Tom? Uh, yeah. So just to your point, I, I think you're absolutely right, Corey. There's a there's such a power to helping teams communicate their work internally, right? Like especially an enterprise company where it's like the the disconnect between the actual results versus the internal perception of the work is that <laughs> and you can manipulate the internal perception of something with how you position it how you report on it like you said simple dashboards right. long-term thinking early indicators of success like all those things are, uh, are great things um to your point about frameworks ross one framework that i've loved using and referencing is this framework called hero hub hygiene uh, that was actually developed by youtube um, as a way to help creators think about creating content in a kind of regular cycle. But one of the big challenges I have with, with enterprise companies is trying to get them to think outside the framework of every piece of content is the same. And there's two things that are nice about it. One is like it's a very simple model. Simple things work well for enterprise companies. Um, so Hero Hub Hygiene. Um, it's also from YouTube. So it has this like great brand weight. Everyone is like, oh, YouTube recommends it. That's great. Um, but the thing that um, I like about it is that it forces you to think about, OK, this is the content that we're going to make, which is like every single day. This is the content that we're going to make that answers direct uh, like um, service journalism, like questions that people search for, which is like search. Um, and then you've got the hero content, which is like, hey, well, let's do some big things every now and again, right? Let's try and put some more investment in and have an outsized return. And when you layer all of those three things on top of each other, you come up with kind of like a media plan, which is more exciting than let's just do the same content all the time. Um, and so is I've been a big fan of that. Is there any like ratio to that? Like, uh, no, I mean, it's like it's such it's a, it's a super dumb framework of <laughs> it is literally like hero hub just hygiene. And I'm just like, like I always extend it and reference kind of deepen it and put it in the context of the client. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, and you can you can read about it like Google um, YouTube has a, has a PDF you can download, blah, blah, blah. Um, uh, but I feel like it's just such a useful framework to try and help them think outside of the, of the idea of content is content. Mm -hmm. And actually, that's completely not true. Like you can spend, you know, like this video we're recording now is like way more expensive and time intensive than doing a blog post. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but you should get clients to think about that way of, OK, it's, it's good to do regular content because it keeps the audience engaged. But it's also good to do content occasionally that is designed to get, you know, swing uh, for the uh, yeah, swing for the fences, basically, right? Um, uh, and it sounds obvious, but a lot of clients just don't mm. do that, right? Yeah, um, I mean, I it kind of going back to differentiation, it's like, can you really differentiate if you never do that hero part? Right. It's no, I, don't mean, I, I yeah. mean, well, I mean, yeah. Yeah, no, it's hard. hard. Right? It's super hard. Yeah. 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 Internally, we like uh, keyword opposition to benefit analysis. It's originally popularized by Todd Malcote, uh, really smart SEO, old school guy, now work, lives on a boat. Uh, <laughs> it works so well for him. I don't but, think he lives on a boat. I no, think he, he works he, on a boat. He works on a boat. That's a story that needs more <laughs> doubt. You can't just say he lives on a boat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No. He was good at ranking for Miami boats. Yeah. And now he's also that. true. All right. <laughs> yeah, he's like a fisherman. He's like fisherman. a legit fisherman. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, smart guy. And kind of we sort of took a spin on his idea. And the general framework is going back to traffic cost and traffic value is you took search volume, uh, how much you can monetize that with, which is for us, if we don't have access to those numbers, but internally, hopefully it's revenue through PPC or signups or conversions or some way. And then you also apply keyword difficulties. So that could be eye test, that could be Ahrefs or any of your favorite keyword difficulty tool of, of choice. And you mash that up in an equation, which basically outputs this content is the lowest difficulty, highest monetization opportunity for us right now. Therefore, you create about 100 of those. Uh, maybe you create some other metrics, like how long is this going to take us to build this? And you can build your own equation to get add more layers to that, and make it more interesting to get the highest output uh, from that analysis. And there's different takes on that, but I think it's useful for a, a company to do that and kind of do a comprehensive uh, analysis of what's possible for them, and then prioritize things based on that KOB framework uh, that Tom, uh, not Tom, but uh, Todd. Uh, originally uh, originated and now lives on a boat because of it. <laughs> and I'm curious for I mean, your apology of the boat, <laughs> the boat that SEO we'll built. Cut to uh, a boat uh, or something. <laughs> I'm curious uh, for the framework, and it's called Hero Hero Hub Hygiene. Hero Hub Hygiene. Do you find that um, 
is exclusively for just working teams? Or is this something that it helps communicate what you're going to be creating uh, across the board? And do do you find that like executives actually like find that interesting? I mean, it's it's a very buzzy word, right? Yeah, so, I mean, and and the YouTube thing like sells it. It you know? really does. <laughs> like, it, it is, in fact, is primarily an executive thing. Like okay. I, I like it much more as a you know when when a CMO or a CEO when you want to make them feel safe that you have a good plan. Right. You're like we have a framework. It's trusted by YouTube. We're going to yeah. follow this model. Blah blah blah. Um, it's better it than is, it, it, the it, guy it, in a boat. You know? <laughs> <laughs> there was a guy on a boat, and he yeah. had this framework, and yeah. the CEO was like, wait a second. Yeah, yeah. yeah I don't know. Um, I don't know about this. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really good for getting executive buy-in. I, I also find it useful for the working team. Like, uh, I think it needs more detail. It's like the framework as is. Uh, I don't think does a good enough job of really telling you what to do. Uh, so you have to do a lot more work. But as a kind of high level framework for an executive to be like, that sounds like a reasonable plan. Um, and when you Google it as well, there's these pretty charts where it's like you have these like three buckets basically that kind of grow at different rates and they layer on top of each other to make this like big like up and to the right oh, thing um, which is just you drop it in a slide and everyone's like whoa yeah we want yeah. that it's like great I mean our framework is generally like we're just a, we're just kind of ripping off the standard like consulting str you know strategic uh, planning framework and then and applying that to SEO and, and making it two look by two. yeah and making it look really mature right um, and, and it, that's also super simple I mean the, the, the consultants have figured it out you know this right. is tried and true test yeah. tested plan so uh, Tom obviously you you came from Google I going back to aspirational and that's your background obviously you don't have to peel back an NDA I'm sure you signed at some point yeah. but just curious how did coming from Google and being internal there how did they think about that is there like a f 10 second blurb on how that worked or it was like a two hour long blurb on how that worked. Um, Five minutes, two minutes. Like, uh, so one of the things that I thought was super interesting, so while I was at Google, uh, Lorraine, who I think is still the CMO there, um, there were these stats that came out about how the trust in the Google brand was slipping. And so she implemented this kind of company wide across the entire marketing organization, uh, a focus on winning back the trust of users brand loyalty and those kind of things. And it was really interesting looking at quite how core that was to their business, right? Like you can look at, you know, customer acquisition and the things that are more measurable and so on, but having that as a linchpin for driving marketing activity was really insightful and really uh, helpful for me to learn just about brand marketing and, and those kind of things. Um, the team I worked for at Google for, for most of the time I was there was a team called the Creative Lab which does quite weird work. Um, they don't have a, a, a product they work for. They work across the whole of Google. So we had a kind of slightly unusual remit in a lot of situations. But again, that was helpful in seeing just lots of different teams uh, working side by side. Um, but I do think it's like, you know, there, was, there were simple things like, you know, one of the things that Lorraine implemented uh, while I was there was all of the login pages on Google look different when you log into Gmail, YouTube, uh, search, and all the other AdWords, all the other weird and wonderful places you can log in, um, they all look different. And there was a mass, like a big uh, engineering project to make them all look and feel exactly the same. And that was one of those things where it was like, it's really hard to quantify the value of that. And yet, when it had been completed, everyone was like, this feels so much nicer, right? Like, uh, you know, an advertiser who's trying to log in to run YouTube ads and trying to log in to run AdWords uh, ads and just making that experience feel the same has a real real impact on uh, brand perception and, and uh, just you know ease of use, consistency, all those things. It's interesting you say that because I, I, I think about logging into G Suite and there's like some guy who's like looking to the left at a computer. I don't know if anyone else remembers that, but <laughs> it sticks with me, but I don't know. I, it, it makes sense that that resonates. Um, it's funny that I just know, it doesn't irritate me or change my perception of Google, but right, that, right. that stands out. Those little way. things matter. Those little details yeah. really make a difference, especially yeah. at the brand level. Uh -huh. right? yeah. Or like I use, um, I, I, maybe anyone uses it as, uh, they have a consumerbarometer.com, mm -hmm. and you can like mess with all of the data that Google consumer survey that they've, they've handed out. And so you look at all this data and you can like toggle the person used a smartphone or didn't use a smartphone. They used, uh, they're in the West Coast or the East Coast. And you change all these, you can understand like, buying behaviors and, and things about the customer. And I start using all this Google product, I'm like, this is amazing. And then I start looking at the data source, and it's a survey from 2014. Right. Yeah, and it's just like, wait a minute, this is not, if you look at like buying behavior on a smartphone, and it's like 38% of people don't research. I'm like, I don't believe that right. for a second. Right. You know, 2014 is a long time ago, when we think about the day and you know, where we are today. Think about like the phone that you were using in 2014 was a lot clunkier than you know, what you're using today, which is like an amazing, 
You're not an iPhone guy, right? No. Not an iPhone guy. Uh, uh, so. <laughs> I'm an Android guy, yeah, as you might we tell. We thought Tom yeah, had so. taste before this interview, but <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's going to warn you wearing old bits. Hey. Um, uh, you put your socks correct. You got, pur you got <laughs> is purple cats on his shirt. I think they're snow leopards, but uh, anyway. Snow um, <laughs> uh, so, but, 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 so back to your point, uh, actually, your point, Corey, uh, about brand. It was really, there was the other interesting thing about working at Google, getting a glimpse into those projects was quite how much of the like senior strategic buy-in across the entire company was driven by a survey. It was driven by a, like, you know, we run a, a 20, 20 question survey across, you know, North America. And yeah, we run it on maybe 5,000 individuals, but that percentage of people who are like, yeah, I like Google, I don't like Google, or like, you know, trust right. is increasing, decreasing, like that dictates hundreds of millions of dollars worth of, wow. uh, of brand budget, right? Um, just based on a survey, basically. Um, and I think that's also something to remember is, like enterprises, you, sometimes I feel like people uh, who haven't worked in those environments imagine that enterprises make decisions on, you know, super advanced data sets, and it's like almost never true. It's almost always just like you, you pick a metric <laughs> and you measure it over time and you try and influence it. And mm -hmm. sometimes it's just a survey, especially on the brand stuff, which is like, it's, it's hard to measure, right? Mm -hmm. um, you can obviously do NPS scores and the, you know, there are advanced ways to try and get better at understanding it, but a lot of companies are still using a framework they developed 10 years ago because they want consistency. And so every quarter or every six months, they survey a segment of the population and that was, that's what dictates their brand, that brand uh, metrics. Wow. It's like 65% of surveys are actually inaccurate. I just made that up, but like, <laughs> it tells you. I believe it. Yeah. Yeah. It's probably worse than that. Right. right. <laughs> uh, kind of bringing it full circle and kind of closing thing. I like giving some people something tactical and useful to take away. So I'm curious what the your favorite enterprise, or maybe not favorite, but maybe it's unusual or unknown way of using a tool or just a, a unique tool that people don't talk about that you're finding useful and uh, in your day to day and enterprise work. Uh, yeah, I'm going to uh, talk about the surveys thing again that we were talking about behind the scenes. Um, it's like super old, um, but I still find it is incredibly effective is the Panda survey. Uh, so I don't know who remembers this. Uh, when the Panda update came out and Google, the Google Quality Rater guidelines first got leaked, and there were 10 questions that Google asked the humans to basically validate search results. And it was things like, you know, do you trust this website? Was it written by experts? Would you would pages from this website appear in print? Uh, are there factual errors? There's like 10 of them, I can't remember all of them. Um, and uh, even just you know, end of last year, I just ran one of these for a client. And you do it on a pretty small scale. Client had three websites, and there was one main competitor. We ran 250 questions, 250 responses for these surveys. And you generate a chart pretty graph and you say, you know, your, your competitor is 20% more trusted than you are. And you would be shocked at how much buy-in you can get from that. Like presenting that to an executive, uh, a, a team of executives, they just get it. They're just like, that is a, that is a real quantifiable gap in our business, a, a weakness, a brand weakness. Like it's one thing for us all to kind of say, yeah, we should like appear more trusted or upgrade the design of our site. And everyone kind of head nods. But until you present a chart like that, you don't get the buy-in and the budget. So it really creates action off the back of it. Um, it was funny, I, I, uh, when I was pitching that same client and I said, we should do this Panda survey, we're gonna get really interesting insights. I actually got pushback. One of the executives was like, isn't the Panda survey from like 2007? And I was like, yeah, have you run it? And they were like, <laughs> no. And I was like, well, shut up then, let's just run the damn thing. Like it mm -hmm. costs us like a thousand bucks. Like it's super cheap, um, but it can drive real, real change. Nice. So. I, I think, what to our earlier point talking about uh, leveraging data to create content. Something that I think is pretty interesting is like, oftentimes like in the ideation of leveraging your data, sometimes you don't necessarily know where to go and like what's interesting in your data. And so I think something that's probably underutilized or not talked about enough, I haven't seen you know leverage a lot, is when you're in Google Sheets, on the bottom right there's like a little green button for Explore. And so if you had a bunch of customer data, let's say you had like 10,000 or 100,000 rows of customer data or customer survey, um, or any, any other type of data, like maybe even marketing analysis or stuff that you're doing uh, to, to run the team, you could plug that in there and hit the explore button and Google will tell you, uh, using you know, AI, to tell you all of the interesting facts and the correlations within your data and they, they generate really simple scatter plots and all this really like charts that you're probably not gonna produce yourself and they just give you a list of, of items and so I think for me that's something that, you know, when I have data and I don't necessarily know what I should be looking at, I'm just running in Google Sheets, and Google Sheets tells me. And that's, yes. how about you? Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm liking Ahrefs Link Velocity. I mean, people can look at Link Velocity in lots of different ways, but I find it useful in enterprise context 
when you're up against some massive competitor and they're generating thousands of links per day and you're coming in from a strategic point of view, you can't really say, our content campaign is gonna generate 60 links a month when there's still a gap of 4,000. Kind of going right. back to the total trajectory and value of that content, you can actually narrow it down to a slimmer view of, we're gonna catch them by saying they're generating 200 links per month. On average, you're generating 145. If we can accelerate that process and outpace them, we're gonna make gradual gains and eventually outpace them versus trying to say, hey, we need to do something to generate 60,000 links today. It's probably not gonna do much internally. Uh, so that's one of the things I like uh, in trying to create change internally uh, from an enterprise content marketing perspective. So I appreciate both of you guys coming in. It's been great. Thanks great for having conversation. us. Uh, two great minds on enterprise content marketing and enterprise SEO and strategy in general. And uh, if you like the series, definitely give us a thumbs up, subscribe, check us out on iTunes, and appreciate you guys watching. Thanks. Yeah, nice work. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> What do you call a, uh, a pile of cats? A, a meowton. <laughs> You're going to use that one. You're going to use that one. We're, we're, these are rolling, right? We're rolling, right? Good, good. That and the dance are going to be. I'll end with what's your favorite joke? Uh, <laughs>